Hello and welcome to my channel! Vice Rhino here! Today, we're finishing up my series on Mike Winger with what he calls the hardest of the atheist arguments to deal with. Again, all the videos in this series are in a playlist, but they can each be enjoyed on their own without missing much, so either go and watch the playlist to see everything from the beginning, or keep watching here, because I feel like this one's gonna be good. So let's see what gets Mike hard! I mean, uh, um, let's get hard to get- <sighs> wait, that's not better. Yeah, <sighs> fuck it, just roll the intro. Number five. Okay, this is the hardest argument. Because it took the most Viagra, you see. And it comes from Epicurus. And however, I'll preface it with this. This version of the argument of evil is like the most cringy version of it, but I'm going to talk about it in more detail. This far in, I think it's safe to say that the only version of any argument that Mike is capable of properly discussing is, in fact, the cringiest version of that argument. At first in this series, I was kind of wondering why Mike was going after such a poorly written article, but now it makes sense. The bad article is absolutely trouncing Mike, as he fails to even respond to the actual argument being made at least half of the time, with the actual responses being so shallow and sloppy that it makes the money shot in a porn scene seem deep and clean by comparison. Okay, so Epicurus was an ancient Greek philosopher as well as the founder of the school of philosophy called Epicureanism. Only a few fragments and letters of Epicurus's 300 work, written works remain. And worth mentioning is that the Epicurean trilemma is not found among these works, and the oldest attribution we have of this trilemma to Epicurus comes from the 3rd century Christian author Lactantius, who was writing some 600 years after Epicurus would have lived. From what we actually know of Epicurus, he wouldn't have been an atheist. He was just of the opinion that any gods that might exist would not even concern themselves with human affairs. Now, this is concordant with the trilemma, but it's important to realize that if the trilemma did originate with Epicurus, then it was not an argument against the existence of any gods, it was an argument against the existence of an interventionist god. It's a small distinction, to be sure, but it's still one that's worth making, if for no other reason than making sure we fully understand the nuances of the argument. Also, I should probably point out that one of the reasons we have so few of Epicurus' own writings is because early Christians actively destroyed them because they viewed them as the works of atheism, and we can't have that. And here's the quote from Epicurus. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's not omnipotent, because he doesn't have the power to do it. If he's able but not willing, then he is malevolent. I would, I would argue against that, and I will in a moment. Of course you will, because you have to contend with the existence of a world that very obviously doesn't have an omnipotent benevolent being watching out for it, all while believing that an omnipotent benevolent being is watching out for it. But if he's both able and willing, then whence cometh evil? There's a whole actual argument in response to that, uh, interestingly enough. Yeah, there is. How much do you want to bet that it's one that relies on consequentialist ethics to say that God has done the moral math and determined that allowing a certain amount of evil now will result in a greater good being brought about later? Because even the most ardent supporters of divine command theory retreat to consequentialism as their justification for God allowing or commanding evil. Divine command theory, for those who don't know, is basically the idea that anything God does or commands is morally good for no other reason than it is God commanding or doing it, because God is the source of morality morality, and as such, cannot do or command anything that is not morally good. But those who claim to hold this view can often be found attempting to justify God's actions or commands by appealing to either how morally degraded the people he was acting against were, or by a future greater good that is brought about by allowing evil now. Neither of those is consistent with divine command theory. God commanded or did it, therefore it's good regardless of the consequences, because God is the source of good, so no appeal to an overall increase in what we humans consider to be good is necessary to justify God's actions. Um, is he neither able nor willing, then why call him God? And that last line is really where this trilemma doesn't seem to fit in with what we know of Epicurean philosophy. Gods are real, they exist, they are just so far above us that they aren't even aware of our existence. But we can still learn lessons from them, striving to emulate the moral character of the good gods in our lives. But from the gods' perspectives, it'd be like an ant trying to imitate the morality of a human whose house it lives under. If the human even notices that the ant exists, they aren't really going to pay close enough attention to notice that this ant is trying to emulate them. It's just an ant. The human might even carelessly squish the ant, never having become aware of that ant's feelings towards the human. This would look like a great evil from the ant's perspective, but from the human's perspective, it's morally neutral. It was just an ant, after all. 
But I digress. We've already seen Mike fail to even try and have a cursory understanding of some relatively modern philosophy, so why would we expect him to know any of this about Epicureanism? The argument is that God can't be either, he, either he's not good or he's not powerful. And it's impossible for God to be good and powerful at the same time because he would have stopped all this evil stuff that goes on. So here's the thing. I do consider the problem of evil to be a fairly powerful argument against God, but I'm also willing to acknowledge that it does have a relatively easy to discover fatal weakness from anyone who holds to a variant of consequentialist ethics. An all-knowing, all-powerful being would know exactly what scenario it could create that would bring about the largest possible set of positive consequences. And it is hypothetically possible for a world with as much apparent suffering as ours has to be the world that brings that about, and without knowing absolutely everything myself, I cannot refute that. But as a consequentialist, I can say with 100% certainty that the Christian God did not create such a scenario. Unless you consider the vast majority of people who ever have or ever will exist going to eternal torture in hell to be a good consequence, because Jesus made it quite clear that most people will go to hell when they die when he said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, if you actually subscribe to divine command theory, then this isn't a problem. We don't need to worry about the outcome being a greater good for humanity. God sending most people to hell is a good thing, because it's God that did it. But as we see any time an apologist is asked about the Old Testament genocides, that's not how they actually think about things. They justify God's immoral actions by appealing to a greater evil that would have been the outcome of God's failure to act. We need to understand this was not an arbitrary ethnic cleansing. But in fact, this is a specific judgment on a morally degraded people. God's command for Israel to drive out the Canaanites was not race-based, but behavior-based, as the Canaanites engaged in acts that would be considered criminal in civilized societies. First it starts off with incest, and then it goes into adultery, then it goes into offering your children to Molech, uh, homosexual sins, and then bestiality. And we know from Canaanite primary source documents another, that all of these things were being practiced by the Canaanites. He gives reasons, right? He doesn't just wake up like a mob boss and go, Canaanites, I want them dead, right? He's got reasons for it. And probably the biggest reason, after 400 years of warning, is that the Canaanites were sacrificing their children on the molten hot God, Molech, this idol. It'll never cease to amaze me that these apologists seem to think that a reasonable justification for committing genocide is their practice of child sacrifice. Like, it's bad that they kill some of their babies, therefore it's good that the ancient Hebrews killed all of their babies. Anyway, yeah, the answer to the problem of evil is that, if you believe in consequentialist ethics, God has made sure that he created the universe with the maximum amount of good as the ultimate outcome. We just lack the knowledge required to be able to see that. But this has a whole host of other problems when we get to the specifics of the Christian God. Whenever you're given a dilemma, this is a dilemma, actually it's a quadrilemma, right? You're given four options and you're being told these are your only options. Well, when phrased properly, it's actually a trilemma that pits each of the three omni-properties of God, omnipotence, omnibenevolence, and omniscience, against the realities of the world. If God is omniscient and omnipotent, then he knows of all evil and can stop it, but does not, so cannot be omnibenevolent. If God is omnipotent and omnibenevolent, then he wants to stop evil and can do so, so if evil exists, then he cannot be omniscient, as the only reason not all evil would be eliminated in this scenario is if God doesn't know of all evil. If God is omniscient and omnibenevolent, then he knows all the evil that exists and wants to stop it, so the continued existence of evil means that God cannot be omnipotent. Notice that this does not preclude the existence of a God who simply lacks one or more of the omni characteristics. The then why call him God question at the end is a later addition that ignores the fact that, in the vast majority of religions throughout history, the gods that they believed in did not have these three omni characteristics simultaneously. That's a comparatively recent religious development. So for most of human history, a god did not have to have all three of these omnis in order to be considered a god. The first thing you need to ask is things like, do I actually have other options? Are these really my only four options? No, those aren't your only options. As I already pointed out, there are at least two other options here. 
Either divine command theory is correct, and therefore anything we consider to be evil is permitted by God to exist, so is actually good. I'd argue that this includes human actions that Christians generally think of as evil, because God actively created those people knowing exactly what they would do in their lives, so all the actions that the people take in their lives are God's actions by proxy. If God didn't want those actions to be taken, he wouldn't have made the people that take them. So in this view, everything that exists and that happens within that existence is good, because God is responsible for everything existing, and everything God does or commands is definitionally good. Or the other option that I see is that consequentialist ethics are correct, and God has created the world that will result in the ultimate maximization of good, even if it requires the occasional holocaust to get us there. A third alternative, of course, is just that God does not exist, and humanity is on its own when it comes to figuring out ethics. That's the one that I think works best with our observations about reality, but I don't think that's one that Mike is willing to consider. Look, you either give me $50 or you give me $100. It's up to you. Okay, are those really my only two options? And in that case, obviously no. I'll grant that that was a valid analogy for a false dilemma, but it wasn't a very good one. Here's what I think is a better example. When you die, you either go to heaven or hell. This ignores the possibilities of there being nothing, reincarnation, continuing to exist as a ghost, going to purgatory, or any number of other potential afterlife options. Sure, Christians who actually believe what they preach will think that this is a true dilemma, but that just brings us back to the apparent inability of apologists to create accurate hypotheticals from perspectives other than Christianity. From the atheist perspective, heaven and hell don't exist, so to say that we're going to one or the other is nonsensical. Sure, maybe the atheists are wrong, but that doesn't mean that Christianity wins by default. Hell, I've even known one woman who called herself an atheist who believed that we are actually all immortal interdimensional beings who insert themselves into mortal life and then wipe their memories of their interdimensional existence as a form of entertainment. So when we die, we just continue being interdimensional immortals. She didn't believe that these beings are gods, and didn't believe in what we would call gods, so I guess she was technically an atheist. But that's not exactly a common belief among atheists. So if she is correct, then most atheists are wrong, but the correct answer still ended up being an atheist one. So let's look at this again and, and just ask, is there another option? Um, how about this? How about a very biblical option, which is that God allows evil temporarily, and he brings goods out of that scenario. He's accomplishing good things during the time where evil's going on. He's working it together for good, like Romans 8.28 says, and that he will put a, an eventual stop to evil, and then there'll be a new heaven and new earth wherein righteousness dwells. This is a major theme in the scripture. Well, it's interesting that Romans 8.28 is your go-to verse to support that idea, because it explicitly states that this is only applicable to believers. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So as it turns out, this isn't an option that is outside of the trilemma. This is in fact option one of the trilemma. God is omniscient and omnipotent, but not omnibenevolent. His benevolence is limited to those who love him. But it's also demonstrably false, at least on a personal level. For me, I did love God when I was a Christian. But my life has gotten way better as an atheist. I have more friends with deeper connections than I had when I was a Christian. I make more money than I ever did as a Christian. Like, I'm not wealthy unless we start comparing me to people in developing nations. But as much as I joke about how expensive it is to feed five children, I'm not worried that I won't be able to like I was when I was a Christian making minimum wage with only one kid. I don't have to worry about being bigoted against people that Christian leaders say we should be bigoted against for no other reason than a couple passages in a book that was written 2,000 plus years ago. I don't have to be worried that learning a cool new scientific fact will have an impact on the central beliefs of my life, because I can make learning as much as possible a core value, rather than having to try and fit new facts within a rigid and unyielding belief structure. And all of these are ways in which my life improved after I stopped being a Christian, and the list is not exhaustive. But again, getting back to the apologist and ability to properly consider things from any perspective other than their own, I'm told over and over again by apologists that the reason I left Christianity is because of sex. And yes, I am currently living with my partner, and we are not married. But having experienced 16 years of monogamous marriage, the majority of which was spent as a believing Christian, I can tell you that the sex aspect of the relationship is functionally the same. I mean, yes, there are differences between my current partner and my wife, but that's not the kind of difference I'm talking about here. Ah, but I mentioned my wife, who most of you will be aware died suddenly at the age of 35 back in 2021. How can I say my life is better when such a bad thing happened? 
And true, I have experienced more loss as an atheist than I did as a Christian. But that's a function of time. Everyone who continues living will be more likely to experience a loss of this kind with each passing year, as their friends and loved ones age as well. And yes, 35 was tragically young, but that's part of the problem of evil. In a universe without a benevolent god caring for its denizens, such things are to be expected. But in the Christian worldview, God killed her at a time when he knew she would be condemned to hell, and so is now being tortured for all eternity. What good could be brought about through killing her that could justify that? Like, honestly, I've used that event to make content speaking out against the Christian God, so in all probability, the most likely outcome when it comes to number of souls saved as a result of her death will be a net negative. If Christianity is true, I've used that event in a way that will result in even more people being condemned to hell than if it never happened. Which kind of flies in the face of the whole God will make everything work out for the best thing. But also, even coming out on the other side of that dark time in my life, I am happy again. Yes, that was a wound that will likely never fully heal, but the one life I have to live goes on. And I've got wonderful people in my life that I love and support, and who love and support me. And given what I know of her cause of death, that would have happened at that time regardless of whether I was a Christian or not. But as an atheist, I don't have to worry about the afterlife logistics. Though, really, Jesus put that to rest by essentially saying that there'd be no marriage or sex in heaven anyway, in Matthew 22, 23-33, when the Pharisees asked him about a similar logistical issue. So, yeah. All this to say that the Bible only says that God will make things work out for the best for believers, and that my life got better pretty much as soon as I stopped being a believer, so that is demonstrably false. God using evil for good temporarily and then, and then bringing about an ultimate, wonderful, permanent state where there's no evil. And this, actually, gets to my next problem with the proposed solutions to the problem of evil. God is supposed to be omnipotent, all-powerful, capable of doing anything. As Jesus says in Matthew 19, 26, with man this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Not most things, not only logically possible things, but all things. Which means that it was possible for God to create that ultimate, wonderful, permanent state where there's no evil right from the get-go. Which means that the only reason that evil exists, if this God exists, is because he wanted it to. In fact, there are philosophers that will argue that the only way to have the optimal world is to first have a world or a, a, a season, a time, where you have a sub-optimal world so that suffering can exist. And then later you have your optimal world because you need benef there's benefits that come in suffering and you need to carry those into that eternal world. And the implication of there being a required world of suffering and evil in order for the optimal world to be truly optimal means that God cannot be all powerful because an ability to do all things, as Jesus said he could do, would include the ability to create this optimal world without requiring a world of suffering to come first. So if you want to believe that, then that's fine, but that belief includes the removal of the property of omnipotence from God. And I know some people will take issue with my pointing out that Jesus didn't stipulate that all things are possible with God, but that all things are limited to things that are logically possible, but I'd argue that that's a moot point here. There's nothing logically impossible about an optimal world existing without being preceded by a world full of suffering and evil. That whole argument relies on the way our brains work. A cold glass of water is better on a day that is insufferably hot than on a mild day because of the contrast between being uncomfortably hot and the cool, refreshing feeling of the water. But it didn't have to be this way. God could have designed us in such a way that everything good is experienced optimally every time, without needing the contrast to make it better. But also, if our existence in heaven is still limited by how our brains function on earth, requiring this contrast to make heaven seem that much better by comparison, then it's a reasonable expectation that our brains would also continue with their tendency to lose the emotional impact of a memory as time goes on. Meaning that without some sort of reset that periodically provides more suffering, the great good of heaven will seem less good as time goes on, as the point of comparison grows more and more distant. Though this distancing of emotional impact from memories as time goes on has been hypothesized to be one of the functions of sleep. While sleeping, the neural connections associated with the emotional impact of the memory are weakened, while the connections associated with the details of the event are strengthened, which allows for the later recollection of the emotional event without the associated emotional reactivity. This is why sleep on it is good advice if you're angry about something. You're going to be less emotional about it, and so will be more able to think rationally after sleeping and make good decisions. And while the Bible doesn't explicitly state that there won't be any sleep in heaven, it does say in Revelation 21, 23 through 24, that there will be no need of sun or moon because God will give it light and there will be no night. 
Which, again, if we're limiting ourselves to the way human psychology works on Earth, I'm pretty sure that keeping bright lights on people while depriving them of sleep is a form of torture. There are four lights! And I think there's a strong argument that can be made for that. Oddly enough, it's so biblical. That's what's trippy. It's so biblical. There's so many scriptures. I talk about them all the time. I know. It's so surprising that the authors of the foundational book of the religion tried to incorporate answers to objections that had been used against other gods for hundreds of years before the New Testament was written. Though, really, you'd expect that if the Bible were actually given to us by an all-knowing, all-powerful God, it would have done a better job at this than it did about God using our suffering, about God working all things together for good, about how your character's being changed by the things you go through, all that kind of thing. Okay, but once again, keep in mind that the Bible also says that most people go to hell. Hell is the ultimate bad experience with no good brought about for you once you go there. So by the Bible's admission, most of the bad experiences, when you total them all up, will result in no benefit to the person experiencing it. And there will be more people having these bad experiences than there will be people having good experiences in heaven. So on balance, including the afterlife, the Christian worldview is that there will be significantly more people permanently suffering than people benefiting from having previously suffered but now enjoying eternal paradise that is made better by the memory of their suffering. If God were all-powerful, he could have created a system with no hell. So either he's not all-powerful, he wanted a world with way more suffering than was necessary, or none of this is actually real. And you believe this too, you probably do already, that there's hard times in your life you went through that you look back on, and you would have wished them away if you could have, but you look back on it and you go, man, I'm so grateful for what I learned through that. I'm so grateful for the good that came out of that. Sure there are, but there are also plenty of times that I look back on and say, yeah, I really could have done without that. That didn't actually have a net positive impact on my life. And while it is difficult for someone in as privileged a position as me to say specifically, my life would have been better if this had not happened, because my life is pretty darn good right now, it is important to recognize that the ability to say the hard times in my life worked out for the best is something that comes from a position of privilege. But people who live their entire lives in poverty and pain cannot say the same thing. People who suffer an injury or illness that permanently disables them, who end up not being able to make ends meet because they can't work anymore, cannot say the same thing. Families who are permanently separated by war cannot say the same thing. And I could keep going, but then this video would get super depressing. And yeah, there's that whole bootstraps mentality, the idea that luck doesn't really exist. Luck is just where preparation meets opportunity. But it doesn't matter how much you prepare if the opportunity never comes along, or if you prepared for a different kind of opportunity than the one that comes along, or if you mistake something for an opportunity when it wasn't and so are unable to take advantage of the actual opportunity that comes along afterwards. And yeah, once again, I could keep going with this. This is a callous response to the problem of evil that basically disregards most of the very real suffering that people have, treating every bad thing that could possibly happen to anyone as a potential opportunity for personal growth, when sometimes it's just that life sucks. And there's other times you can't do that, right? You don't know what good came out of it. I'm not saying you can always figure it out. In fact, I'll argue against that. But at least you know it's possible, right? It's possible. No, sometimes you know for sure that it's not possible. According to Christians, everyone who has died and not been a Christian is now suffering in eternal torture. What good will come of that? Are they experiencing personal growth in hell? Are they able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps all the way into heaven? If your answer is no, then you'd agree that not all suffering has this potential. Now, of course, I don't believe in an afterlife, so I only have to contend with the suffering in this life, and sometimes it is possible that things that seem bad in the moment actually do work out for the best, but I'd wager that that's actually the exception rather than the rule. Sure, it's the one that makes a more satisfying movie, so it's an idea that permeates our culture, but more often than not, a bad thing that happens is just a bad thing that happened. I didn't become extra resilient when my middle child almost died during childbirth and had to be resuscitated. I just had a bunch of stress that increased my risk of developing heart disease, diabetes, depression, and a bunch of other stuff. And if it's possible that God might be doing something good through allowing the suffering and evil in the world temporarily, if that's even possible, then the logical problem of evil fails completely. Maybe, but God isn't allowing suffering temporarily. Again, and I cannot stress this enough, according to the Bible, most people go to hell. In the Christian worldview, the afterlife has infinitely more suffering than this world ever could, and none of those people will experience a good benefit from that suffering. 
and it has failed. The logical problem of evil is not used by pretty much any philosophers at all right now. It sure would be embarrassing for Mike if I played a clip here of a modern philosopher, like say Dr. Michael Tooley, saying something along the lines of the central argument for atheism is the argument from evil, wouldn't it? The central argument for atheism, the argument from evil. That same philosopher also published a paper in 2012 called Inductive Logic and the Probability That God Exists, Farewell to Skeptical Theism, which was a novel take on the inductive problem of evil which Christian philosophers have since responded to, and which other philosophers, and Tully himself again in 2022, responded to their responses. Almost like this is still an active area of discussion in philosophical circles. And this is all just a conversation around one single iteration of this argument, which has many different forms. Really, Mike, if the problem of evil were so utterly and thoroughly refuted, your best course of action would just be to explain the refutation. There wouldn't be this need for you to assert things that aren't true in order to attack the argument's popularity without addressing its points. I mean, I know he thinks he's about to address the point, so it's not so much a reverse argument from popularity, it's more of a poisoning the well. If you go into this discussion with the idea that modern philosophers don't actually take the problem of evil seriously, then even if you don't find Mike's answer satisfying, you can take comfort in the fact that professional philosophers don't think it's a problem, so a response that is satisfying, and does make sense, just must be out there somewhere. Except that's just not true. As I pointed out, it's still very much an active area of philosophical debate. So you're given a dilemma. The dilemma is, are these my only options? And the answer is no, they're not. It could just be that God will eventually stop evil. So this is where I'll admit that one of the issues with the version of the problem of evil that I've been presenting is the assumption that suffering continues to be evil, even if it's in the afterlife. I would argue that it still is, but that's where Mike would probably retreat to an iteration of divine command theory, where God did it so it can't be evil, or to an apologetic about how the people that go to hell choose their fate for themselves, which is a whole other can of worms that I'm not gonna get into here. God is all powerful. God is all good. God is allowing evil. Therefore, he must have a reason and he must be putting it to an end at some point. You saying that these things necessitate God having a reason for allowing evil and planning to end it at some point, once again renders morality consequentialist in nature rather than being derived from God's nature. If God were the source of all morality, then he doesn't need to justify his choice to allow evil. It cannot actually be evil if he allows it because everything he does is definitionally good. Both of those things are taught in Christianity. It may follow that if there's a true religion, it'll be a religion that offers a solution to the problem of evil because it's a significant issue. I mean, yeah, that's kind of like saying if there's a true religion, it's the one that is true. Granted, some religions solve the problem of evil by just not having gods with the internally inconsistent omni characteristics in the first place. If there are a mix of good gods, evil gods, and neutral gods, all with approximately equal but limited power, then it stands to reason that the good gods won't be able to stop the evil gods from working their evil all the time, because it's just not possible for them. But that is still a solution to the problem. Atheism, though, has the advantage of not even having a problem of evil. Evil itself is a human construct. It's not a noun, something that exists in the universe. It's a description of conditions that we don't like. And why do conditions that we don't like exist? Because the universe is a big old messy place that doesn't care about us, and there's no all-powerful being looking out for us. So sometimes shit happens that we don't like. And religion, uh, Christianity in particular, does offer a solution to the problem of evil. Buddhism does not, for instance. To the best of my knowledge, Buddhism doesn't have a problem of evil. There is no triomni god in Buddhism that would be looking out for us if it existed. Evil, or suffering rather, is caused by desire, and to eliminate suffering, you eliminate desire. It's all self-contained. Now, there is a sutra within Buddhism, the Tathagatagarbha, which sort of has a problem of evil. The text says that within every human is an intrinsically pure Buddha, so the problem specific to this doctrine, which is a fringe doctrine of Buddhism, not a mainstream one, is a question of why the intrinsically pure Buddha within everyone allows anyone to do evil at all. To which the answer is, as it so often is with any non-Abrahamic religion, that these pure Buddhas are not omnipotent. They can't stop you from following your desires, they just provide the twinge of conscience when you do do evil. Thor does not offer a solution to the problem of evil. There isn't a theodicy on Thor. That's because, and I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, in a polytheistic worldview there is no problem of evil, so it doesn't need to be solved. Which is itself a solution of sorts. By the way, the, the, let me talk about theodicies for a minute. 
a theodicy is an attempt to explain the problem of evil. It's something like, like the author said, it's been going on forever and ever, right? For thousands of years, they've been talking about theodicies, explaining the problem of evil. And in those thousands of years, the theodicies have stayed largely the same. Like, in Callum Miller's response to Thule's version of the problem of evil, he says, it might be that the unknown properties of the action do not just outweigh the wrong-making properties, but actually negate the wrong-makingness of the wrong-making properties altogether by integrating it into a complex whole in which it no longer has weight as a wrong-making property. That's basically modern philosopher speak for, we don't know how this could all work out for the best, but it could, so you can't say that God doesn't exist, because he might make everything work out for the best in a way that we just can't see. This response to the problem of evil goes back at least to the 16th century philosopher Michel de Montaigne, and hasn't changed a whole lot aside from just being rephrased into technical jargon. Others go back even farther, with ancient Roman authors writing defenses of the righteousness of their gods, and the ancient Greeks attributing evil to fate, which is a power beyond even that of the gods. Soul building. There is a soul building theodicy, and philosophers have spent a lot of work on this. Okay, fine. Go ahead and prove my point for me by appealing to a theodicy that goes back to at least the second century church father Irenaeus, and hasn't changed a whole lot since then. And basically the idea is that suffering in, it causes growth of character, it causes opportunities to express courage, it allows for the opportunity to, to express the greatest kinds of love, and to do things like forgive. All of which would be possible without the degree of suffering that we see in the world. And some of which aren't even necessarily things that inherently make the world a better place. Like forgiveness. Sure, forgiveness can be a good thing, but would living in a world where forgiveness is unnecessary because nobody does anything to anyone else that requires it be better? Like, I'd rather just not fight with my partner than to have a fight in order to experience the giving or receiving of forgiveness. And courage. Sure, we think of courage as a good thing because in this world of suffering, courage is often a necessary part of alleviating that suffering. Courage is the ability to do the right thing in spite of fear. Fear of something bad happening to you. And often, the right thing in these scenarios is to put your own safety or well-being at risk in order to protect the safety or well-being of others. But would a world where everyone's safety and well-being is assured not be better? Also worth mentioning is that if forgiveness is such a great good that its existence justifies the existence of all the suffering and evil in the world, then you'd think that God would be able to offer forgiveness to anyone who sincerely repents of whatever they need forgiveness for, rather than only offering it to those who believe that he had his son brutally tortured to death so that he could forgive them while still satiating his bloodlust. It seems to me that forgiveness without requiring a punishment first is a greater virtue than forgiveness that is predicated on someone having to suffer because you're mad even if it's the wrong someone. Like if there wasn't any kind of evil or suffering in the world, then forgiveness wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen because it wouldn't need to happen. But also kind of not, because forgiveness could still happen without there being suffering or evil. If I'm out grocery shopping and I forget to buy milk and now we're out of milk, my family can forgive me for my forgetfulness, even though not having milk in the house wasn't evil and didn't cause anyone any suffering. Yet forgiveness is one of the most beautiful and wonderful goods out there. Hmm, I'd put a lot of caveats on that statement. Like, in my forgetting to buy milk scenario, my family forgiving me rather than getting annoyed at me would definitely be a good thing, but if I had a consistent habit of forgetting the milk and it regularly caused disruption, even if it is the fairly minor disruption of just having to have something other than cereal for breakfast, and I was making no effort to correct this forgetfulness, then forgiveness ceases to be a good thing and starts to become a weapon that I wield in order to get away with not having to put effort into changing or growing. Forgiveness is only a good thing if it is freely given by the person who was wronged. Vicarious forgiveness, where you just ask Jesus to forgive you for something you did to another person without apologizing to that other person, is not a good. And the people who are wronged do not automatically owe forgiveness to the person who wronged them. To guilt someone into forgiving someone who's hurt them is not a good thing. I'd argue that it's actually an evil thing, especially when you get into more serious things like abuse. So many people are convinced that forgiving their abuser is part of the healing process when it's not. And abusers will often weaponize this common perception by making a show of apologizing and being remorseful, which makes the victim feel like if they don't forgive them, then they're being a bad person because forgiveness is good and they're clearly apologetic, so now they have an obligation to forgive. And that is not a good thing. The world would be a better place if shit like that did not happen. My, I'm so grateful. Like, I'm, I love God a lot more. 
because of the forgiveness I've received in Christ than I would if he had just made me in heaven perfect. How do you know that? How could you possibly know that? The only way to actually know that would be to have the experience of being made in heaven perfect in order to compare that experience to the one you have now. But also, that's not biblical. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 2 through 3, that it is better to be dead than to be alive, but better still would be to not have ever existed and seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. According to the Bible, the afterlife is not the best possible world for us to live in. It's better than life, sure, but better than both is to just never be born. I just do. Like, there's a good that's coming out of the whole scenario of fall and forgiveness. So we wouldn't have this without suffering. You wouldn't grow without suffering. And children who live lives with no suffering end up being lousy adults. Yeah, four-year-old who died of leukemia, you would have been a lousy adult if you didn't suffer from leukemia. And we know this. <laughs> Maybe you are this. <laughs> well, yes and no. Assuming that by suffering here, you mean a more generalized anything that feels bad in the moment, which would include things like, I'm angry that you're not letting me have candy for dinner, rather than what would typically be meant by suffering, because if you mean what we typically mean by suffering, then you've got a ridiculous position that is so nonsensical as to not even deserve a response. Anyway, there are four typical parenting styles, authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and uninvolved. Authoritarian parents, quote, attempt to shape, control, and evaluate the behavior and attitudes of the child in accordance with a set standard of conduct, usually an absolute standard, theologically motivated, and formulated by a higher authority. They value obedience as a virtue and favor punitive, forceful measures to curb self-will at points where the child's actions and benefits conflict with what they think is right conduct. Permissive parents, quote, attempt to behave in a non-punitive, acceptant, and affirmative manner toward the child's impulses, desires, and actions. They make few demands for household responsibility and orderly behavior. They allow the child to regulate his own activities as much as possible, avoid the exercise of control, and do not encourage him to obey externally defined standards. Authoritative parents, quote, attempt to direct the child's activities, but in a rational, issue-oriented manner. They encourage verbal give and take, and share with the child the reasoning behind their policy. And finally, uninvolved parents, quote, fulfill the child's basic needs while generally remaining detached from the child's life. An uninvolved parent does not utilize a particular disciplining style and has a limited amount of communication with their child. They tend to offer a low amount of nurturing while having either few or no expectations of their children. Of these styles, it is quite clear that authoritative parenting has the best outcomes for children. They will be more confident and responsible, they'll be able to effectively manage their negative emotions, have higher self-esteem, better academic performance, and more. The authoritarian style, which is the one that most closely resembles the parenting style that apologists generally advocate for, ends up with kids who will be well-behaved when an authority figure is present, but will be more aggressive, socially inept, unable to make decisions, have anger management issues, have poor self-esteem, and have a tendency to rebel against authority figures when older. And honestly, this makes sense to me. I went to a Christian high school. There is a cliche among Christian teenagers, or at least there was when I was one, that the pastor's kids, or PKs as they were called, were always rebellious little shits. Though we probably wouldn't have used the term little shits. And what's worse, because they were so good at behaving in front of the authority figures, they could often get away with pretty much anything they wanted, because everyone in charge would just assume that, because they were so well behaved, there was no way they could be involved in whatever scandalous behavior was being discovered. This seems like the kind of kid that would result from authoritarian parenting. The God set the absolute standard for behavior and you will obey, you do not need an explanation view, combined with Bible verses that encourage child abuse, like Proverbs 13 24, which says, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him, which very much suggests that the appropriate way to deal with disobedience is to beat them into submission. This fits the description of authoritarian parenting to a T. This style of parenting also fits the picture that apologists paint of God as our Father pretty well as well, as God has rules that you need to follow, there's no room for questioning the rules even if they don't make sense to you, and there must be punitive measures taken for any disobedience. There isn't a focus on understanding why the rules are what they are. God's ways are above our ways, after all. We can't expect to understand the reasons behind everything he does, which apparently includes designing us in such a way that objectively the best parenting style is not the one that he demonstrates to us. And that's just the reality is we've got to go through hard times. We've got to go through hard times in order to have godly character. Again, though, all things are supposed to be possible through God, which means that God could have made us with godly character right from the get-go without going through hard times. Also, what of infants who die? I assume you think they go straight to heaven, right? 
Do they not have godly character then? Why does God rob them of their chance of developing godly character? That's just part of what happens. And the scripture, the Bible abounds with this sort of teaching. This is thoroughly entrenched in the Christian belief system, is that your suffering brings about goods. I mean, not really. The book of Job, the book of the Bible that most directly tackles the problem of evil, basically comes to the conclusion that being a good servant of God won't protect you from evil, nor will being evil guarantee that God sends divine retribution. You just have to accept your lot in life and recognize that God has ultimate power over everything, so you don't get to question him. Okay, that's the soul-building theodicy. It would explain a lot of the suffering that goes on, but not all of it, I don't think. But the uh, the free will theodicy is, is just this, like, that if you're going to allow people to make free decisions, you can't bar them from doing bad things. The free will theodicy doesn't work unless you give up the idea that there is also free will in heaven. Because if it was impossible for God to create a world with free will and with no suffering, then free will cannot exist in heaven, because that would be the impossible to create world with free will and no suffering. There's also the fact that free will is not a biblical concept. Nothing in the Bible states that God's goal was to give anyone free will, and God on a number of occasions interferes with people's free will through numerous methods, including directly manipulating them, a la Pharaoh's hardened heart, deceiving them so that he can trick them into doing bad things that he can punish them for doing, a la Ezekiel 14, and if we include the logical conclusions of God's omni-properties, his very act of creating took away our free will. If God knows everything, past, present, and future, is all-powerful, and is the creator of everything, then that means that he knows, with 100% certainty, all of the downstream effects of all of his creative acts. What's more, Christians commonly interpret Psalm 139.13 as being generally applicable to everyone, meaning that God personally knits everybody together inside their mother's womb. He knows all of the choices that the person he is creating will make. He knows what changes he could make to the developing fetus that would alter these choices. He knows exactly how this person will interact with every other person they will meet, and how any potential changes to any of those people will impact all of the other people. With such knowledge and power, combined with his personal involvement in the creation of everyone, he effectively makes all of our choices for us by choosing how and when he will make us. The implication of the existence of the Christian God is that free will just does not exist, and as such, cannot be the reason that evil exists. Like, that's not freedom. And so the gar from the Garden of Eden to the Book of Revelation, we see this freedom playing out in the Bible. We see it in reality as well. That a lot of the, not all the evil, a lot of the evil that we see in the world, the most egregious kinds, are human-to-human -human evils or human-to-animal evils that are being done by somebody's free will or as a consequence of allowing free will. So this explains at least some of it. It explains some of it because it's not capable of addressing what are known as the natural evils, pain and suffering due to natural disasters. The underwater earthquake that caused the tsunami in Japan in 2011 was not caused by human actions. It was just a thing that happened as a direct result of how God supposedly designed the earth. God knew when he designed the earth that that exact event would happen eventually, and he also knew how many people would be killed when it happened. He could have designed the earth in a way where such things did not happen, but he chose not to. Natural evil, then, is more obviously directly the result of God's actions than human evil, as we don't even need to make any logical inferences about the nature of free will. It's as simple as God knows everything, and knew everything when he made the earth, so of course he knew that creating the way he did would result in the tsunami in 2011. Another theodicy would be like the natural law theodicy, and that is the idea that, um, I actually had an atheist ask me, Mike, why is it that I stub my toe? That's what I want to know. How is it that stubbing my toe, which hurts a lot, is somehow working together for good? So while that is a bit of a silly question, it does serve to bring to light another aspect of the problem of evil, and it is related to the natural law. So again, in the Christian worldview, God designed everything. And that includes the laws that govern the universe. God made the universe such that some things are physically possible, and others are physically impossible. Being all-powerful, God could have designed a universe where it is physically impossible for humans to do significant evils to each other. They could still have the will to do these evils, but they're just unable to follow through. Just like I could have all the will in the world to fly by flapping my arms. But in the universe we live in, that's a physical impossibility for me. Now, I don't know exactly what such a universe would look like, but one aspect of it could easily be that things that don't need to cause physical pain just don't cause physical pain. We have pain receptors as a warning. Doing things that hurt can lead to damage, and if you don't take action to avoid them, the damage can become quite severe, potentially even permanent or life-threatening. 
but stubbing your toe is not something you really need a warning against. A mild discomfort to let you know that you just can't whip your foot in that direction without worrying about obstructions might be warranted, but the amount of pain that results from a toe stubbing is completely disproportionate to the damage that that stubbing causes. So a universe that doesn't allow for that disproportionate pain to exist would be better. And it may be that part of the reason why there's things, even some natural disasters and stuff is partly, although it may have to do with cosmic battles and things that are going on. Yeah, I think that's a possibility. I just have very little discernment to know when they're happening. Cosmic battles? How very polytheistic of you. Um, at any rate, it also can just be about natural law. That God wants a system of an ordered universe. He wants it. He wants you to be able to do scientific experiments and have consistent results. And he just didn't have either the knowledge or power required to create a universe where such things are possible without it also resulting in a bunch of horrendous natural disasters. Also, like, this essentially breaks down to, I made the universe in a way that would be guaranteed to painfully kill millions of people throughout history so that you could have the fun that comes out of figuring science stuff out. Yay! Oh, also, the act of figuring out some of that science stuff will kill a bunch of you too. Gotta work hard to figure out shit like germs and radiation, after all. He wants you to be able to make choices and be able to predict the, the consequences. He wants you to live in like a real world that really happens now. So when you eventually live in heaven, is that not a real world that really happens now? Will there be no discoveries to make in heaven? No learning that you could possibly do? The more detailed a picture I get of heaven, the worse it sounds. Like, apologists appeal to the things that Mike appealed to earlier in order to justify suffering and evil. It makes the good things feel better. But what about something like learning? Some of the best moments from my life are when I learned something new that made a bunch of stuff that I already knew click into place and really make sense. If heaven is a realm where you can't do science experiments, that implies that you either have full knowledge of how everything works already, or that it's impossible for us to comprehend how everything works. Which means that at some point in eternity, you'll run out of things that it is possible for you to learn. And there are Christians who believe that you get all knowledge magically zooped into your brain when you enter heaven. So right from the get-go, the experience of learning new things, one of my favorite kinds of experience, is gone. And if I somehow end up in heaven, that will be something that I miss about this life. And can heaven really be perfect if I find myself pining for certain aspects of the mortal life again? Right, not a, not a make-believe world where you do something and God decides the outcome uniquely each time. Where you pull a trigger and a marshmallow comes out because God doesn't want to let you shoot people. But rather, well, part of that's free will, but another part of it is just natural law. Having consistent natural laws. But, you know, for the same reason you stubbed your toe, for the same reason that mudslide happened, for the same reason there was a hurricane. Are you really putting limits on God's creativity? God really couldn't think of a world where free will is possible, but the evil and suffering that we see in this world is just physically impossible? What a weak God you worship. I am a God, you dull creature, and I will not be bullied by that. Puny God. Christianity um, offers several different answers. Another one of them, and this might be kind of hinted at in the book of Job, is an answer called skeptical theism. And skeptical theism is a theodicy where you basically say, we're not in a position to know why God would allow different evils in the world. And so we should accept that we don't know and be okay with that. Yeah, that's skeptical theism in a nutshell. But in my opinion, it points to skepticism in the wrong direction. The idea behind calling it skeptical is that we should be skeptical of our ability to figure out God's reasons for doing or not doing anything. But it amounts to a straight up dismissal of the problem with no explanation, basically being an appeal to God's mysterious ways when the question becomes too difficult to answer. Instead of being skeptical of my ability to discern God's rationale for what he does or doesn't do, I'm skeptical of the claim that, given what we know of the God of Christianity, everything will work out for the best because Christianity flat out states that it does not. Well, at least not from the human perspective at any rate. Two verses are all I need to show this, and they're two that I've already quoted today. That one from Matthew about how more people go to hell than heaven, and that one from Ecclesiastes about how it's better to never be born than to exist in the afterlife. I mean, strictly speaking, the ideas of heaven and hell hadn't solidified in the culture at the time that Ecclesiastes was written, so their idea of an afterlife was likely more similar to the Greek concept of Hades, neither good nor bad, just kind of an eternal meh. But I don't suppose the evolving view of the afterlife as the Bible progresses is really all that appealing to Mike, so he's stuck with Ecclesiastes stating flat out that never existing in the first place is better than heaven. 
Would I, with my human limitations, with my cognitive limitations, with my experiential limits, with my observational limits, right, with my with my historical limits being stuck in just this little tiny time zone of my life, would I expect to understand why God allows a forest fire to kill animals in Australia? If this God is a benevolent God who wants as many people to be saved as possible, as the Bible suggests in 2 Peter 3, 9, then it would behoove him to provide us with an understandable explanation. So yes, given that the problem of evil is something that causes people to not be saved, a God who wants as many people as possible to be saved should provide people with an adequate answer to the problem of evil without leaving them floundering. Would I expect to understand that? Not, do, do I understand it? No. Would I expect to? Yes. Given the properties that the Bible ascribes to God, we would expect God to provide us with adequate answers in order that as many people as possible could be saved. Would I anticipate being able to figure out distant evils and hard problems and troubles that go on? Wait, was the distance of the forest fire in Australia actually supposed to be a meaningful part of that equation? I'm not even sure what to do with this information. Like, surely a forest fire of a particular destructive capability is just as bad in North America as it is in Australia. Actually, come to think of it, the Australian one might be less bad because it's going to kill a lot of, like, evil monsters and shit, because Australia's full of those, right? Anyway, I'm not sure why distance would affect the moral calculation. I mean, eventually it gets to a point where it affects the calculation because there's nobody around to be harmed. You know, like the hurricane on Jupiter is way more distant than Australia, but to the best of my knowledge, there are no beings living on Jupiter that are harmed by the hurricane, so calling it bad or evil doesn't really make sense. And it's not really a function of distance, it's just a function of who's there why this child we've been praying for is, is dying. Well, given that Jesus said of those who believe in him that they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover in Mark 16, 18, that shouldn't actually be a possible scenario. No stipulations are given other than the person doing the healing is a believer in Jesus. It doesn't say that they will recover if it's the will of God or if the sick person has enough faith or whatever else it might be. It just flat out states that the believers will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. This is supposed to be one of the signs that accompanies a true believer in Jesus. So praying for a sick child and that child not getting better should not be possible if you're a true Christian. What I expect to know the answer, and I think the answer here, generally speaking, is no. If God is going to promise that his followers will have healing powers, and then his followers don't actually have those powers, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect an explanation for that. I don't expect to know. And now if I don't expect to know, then how can me not knowing be evidence against God? The thing is, a God who has a good reason to allow you to suffer but refuses to explain that reason is probably not the kind of God I would want to worship. I wouldn't consider such a being benevolent. Keep in mind here that benevolence is not about wanting to maximize good in some abstract ethereal sense. Benevolence is wishing well for others. To be omnibenevolent is to wish well on everyone, and not just wishing well, but wishing the best possible outcome for everyone. What reason could there possibly be to allow suffering for someone that you want the best possible outcome for, that explaining that reason in a way that they can understand would somehow worsen that outcome? I'd imagine that there are a lot of former Christians for whom the problem of evil is the primary cause of their deconversion. It stands to reason that at least some of them would either not have deconverted or would reconvert if an adequate explanation was given. So the conclusion here is that either God does not have an adequate explanation, or that he's not omnibenevolent, or again that he just doesn't exist. And I take a cumulative answer. I would say, yeah, all of these theodicies and more I find interesting. And I think what they do is they give us very a lot of ways to answer the problem of evil, not just the logical problem, but even the sort of practical experiential problem or the probabilistic problem of evil that are, these are just other terms for different variations of the problem. And all of these theodicies have flaws or are incomplete solutions. So to cover these flaws and the fact that they're incomplete, they wind up falling back on the mysterious ways answer that is skeptical theism. Christianity not only gives you an explanation for evil and a lot of ways to understand and deal with the fact that there's evil in the world. Did you mean to say not only there, or would that more properly have been Christianity does not even give you an explanation for evil? Like, given that the final theodicy is literally, I don't expect there to be an explanation for evil, how can you then turn around and say that Christianity gives you an explanation? It also gives you something so wonderful. It gives you hope 
of a solution to the problem of evil. And this is understated when atheists talk about the problem. It's understated because it's irrelevant. If the problem of evil demonstrates that Christianity is not true, then Christianity's solution of a magical happy place that you go to when you die is completely irrelevant. But even so, the fact of the matter is that the Bible explicitly states that God created evil in Isaiah 45, 7. It explicitly states that it's better to never have been born than to live and then die. It explicitly states that the vast majority of people that God creates will wind up living in eternal torture with no hope of reprieve. So even if we take your magical happy place into account, most people will never see it. So the problem of evil just exists eternally for them. And on top of all that, God's initial design that allowed evil to enter the world in the first place seemed to have been set up specifically to accomplish that, rather than being a perfect scenario designed to maximize the benefit of the humans he created. Not very subtle of the Almighty, though. Fruit tree in the middle of a garden where they don't touch sign. Why not put it on the top of a high mountain? Or on the moon? Christianity says here's not only an explanation of the issue, perspective and wisdom on how to handle it, but here's a solution too. If it actually provided a solution, you probably should have led with that rather than explaining the imperfect theodicies that all wind up at a, well, God has a plan and we shouldn't expect to understand it anyway answer. It's all part of the great plan. It's not for us to understand. It's ineffable. The great plan's ineffable. Exactly. It is beyond understanding and incapable of being put into words. You feel this intense problem. It, you might even say the problem of evil is so bad that I would think if any religion's true, it better deal with this issue. Oh, okay then. Since by your own admission earlier, Christianity doesn't deal with it, since we apparently shouldn't expect God to provide us with an adequate explanation, Christianity is then also not true. And Christianity deals with it on the explanation side, and it deals with it on the other side, which is the, the resolution side. So I can explain it and I can resolve it in Christian faith. If your explanation is, we shouldn't expect there to be an explanation, can you really say that it deals with it on the explanation side? And you just need to wait on him and trust in him and rest in him. And here's advice that you can't give as an atheist. There is just no hope. There is just no solution. There is just a suck it up. That's the way it is. And I am uh, I think that makes atheism not only intellectually inferior, which we'll talk about in two seconds here, but also uh, pragmatically inferior. The hope of atheism lies in secular humanism. We recognize that this is the only life we get, so we try to make it as good as possible for as many people as possible. And yeah, I must admit that when accomplishing this means trying to convince people like Mike to actually be decent human beings, it does seem like a rather hopeless endeavor. But to then conclude that I don't like that fact, therefore there must be a god, is nothing more than an argument from consequences. Sure, I would love it if there were some supreme being that would ultimately make everything work out for the best for everybody, but there is no indication that such a being exists, and Christianity is pretty explicit about saying that it's not what God does, otherwise hell would be more like the Catholic idea of purgatory. You're punished in proportion to your bad actions, and once you've completed the punishment, you can move on into heaven. Of course, there would be problems with this system as well, but it's a better system than any that has eternal torture as an option. Like, maybe if your actions are heinous enough, you go through the punishment and then cease to exist? And what kind of punishment is it anyway? Like, is it just straight up torture? Sure, I'd say that stealing is wrong, but I don't think a thief deserves to be tortured even a little bit for their crime. I'm more in favor of a rehabilitative justice system than one based on retribution. Either way, my point is that humans are able to create a better conception of an afterlife system than God. Just watch The Good Place. Sure, it gets there in an over-the-top silly way, but it still gets there. And if mere humans can come up with a better idea of an afterlife than God, then what does that say about God? Right, Christianity is better than atheism in that it doesn't leave people as a, as a void. And why do you think that atheism leaves people as a void? How does the absence of an afterlife leave you as a void in this life? If anything, it gives this life more potential to be fulfilling, because a knowledge that it's the only one you get can prompt you to accomplish more than you would if you thought this was just a trial run, with the afterlife being the real one. Thinking that this life is temporary and you're guaranteed eternal paradise after you die can lead you to complacency. 
I don't need to take this opportunity to travel the world. I'll have an eternity to do all the traveling I want in an even better world later. I don't need to reconcile with the LGBTQ child I kicked out of my home, because if it's God's will, they'll come back to Christianity eventually, and I'll have an eternity to spend with them. If it's not God's will, then so be it. I still get eternal paradise. Having the thought that this life is the only one you get in the back of your mind will guide you towards making better decisions than having the thought that the next life is the real one in the back of your mind. But there's more. It actually gets worse because the argument here that the atheist offers is uh, it can actually backfire. It can actually spring back and backfire on the atheist. And here's the reason why. The problem of evil assumes one thing that doesn't make sense on an atheist worldview, which is evil. Yeah, I knew it would wind up here eventually. Atheists don't have a supreme being that can dictate morality through a might-makes-right system. Therefore, we can't call bad experiences bad because they're just subjectively based. And who are we, mere subjective beings, to determine that our own subjective experiences are something that we don't like? I don't need God to tell me that I don't like stubbing my toe. I can figure that out all on my own. Moral evil that there's a moral qualities of wickedness or evil or badness in different behaviors. And it assumes that that's a real thing going on in the world. Okay, so the toe stubbing thing might not have a moral element, but like it or not, morality is subjective. As the subjects to which morality applies, we can subjectively figure out the things that we like and dislike, morally speaking, and so assign them labels of good and bad. If morality comes from God, then it's God's subjective likes and dislikes that are assigned the labels of good and bad. But the problem here is that the God of the Bible frequently seems to endorse moral positions that run counter to most of humanity's moral preferences. So when we have a moral disagreement with God, why should our moral opinions yield to God? Might makes right. He has the power to send you to hell to be tortured for eternity if you don't agree with him. So if you want that to not happen, you'd better agree with him. And then you have to ask the question, how on earth is moral good and evil a real thing on atheism? Because we have opinions about what things are morally good and morally bad. And as I've discussed in more detail in other videos, the existence of morality is entirely dependent upon the existence of subjects to which morality could apply, which makes morality subjective by definition. Unless you think that morality exists independently of any subjects, in which case, since God is a subject in this sense, both atheism and Christianity get their morality from the same place. And this place is not the Christian God. Also, minor point, but it bothers me when apologists talk about things being on atheism. Like atheism is some kind of drug or something. I don't even know if this is grammatically right or wrong, but it sounds wrong to me. And actually, as long as I'm talking about grammar, that's an excellent example of something that is a human construct based on nothing but our opinions, but can be objectively measured. Saying I is a atheist is objectively grammatically wrong. Is it inherently wrong? No, it just goes against the rules of grammar that we have subjectively decided are a thing that exists. And as with morality, grammar changes over time. Addressing a group of people as you was grammatically wrong a few centuries ago. Ye was the correct way to do that. And actually, with the way you replaced thee, thou, and ye, English wound up lacking a second person plural pronoun, leading us to say weird things like you guys, you all, or you lot when speaking to groups of people, instead of the more elegant ustedes of Spanish, vu of French, the nohi of Korean, and, well, the second person plural of basically any language that isn't English. The linguistic standard that we use to measure the correctness and incorrectness of grammar has changed and is continuing to change, as several single word alternatives to the clunky modified second person pronoun serve to make it plural, like the use of the New Yorker, the Alia of the Creole, and the Y'all of the South, to name a few. And if I were to make a linguistic prediction, y'all is going to eventually become the grammatically correct second person plural, as it's permeating other English dialects faster than any of the others. I use it myself on occasion, usually for comedic effect, but often with my kids, I will use it unironically to make sure that they know I'm speaking to all of them instead of singling out one of them or using one of the clunkier two-word phrases. Anyway, what I'm getting at here is that we have what is obviously a subjectively derived set of rules by which we measure the objective correctness or incorrectness of our grammar. And these rules can change with culture, frequently with older generations not approving of the changes being made by the younger generations, but with the younger generations eventually winning and then repeating the cycle as their kids start modifying it for themselves. Back in my day, all we needed to say when something was funny was law. Get out of here with your raffle copper nonsense. So my point here is to ask, does language not matter because we don't have an objective basis for grammar, syntax, or vocabulary? 
Can we not truly say what a particular word means in a particular context because we can't ground our language in an unchanging objective standard? Are the grammar police, who are inevitably going to be commenting about some small error that I made in my analysis, wrong to do so because the rules of grammar are subjectively agreed upon, were different in the past, and will be different in the future? And if you did not answer yes to any of those questions, then why would the same logic not apply to morality? And was there not a more objectively correct way that I could have phrased those questions that wouldn't have certain members of my audience trying to count up the double negatives that come with no answers to see if I got my final analysis correct, despite the subjective origin of the rules of grammar? And finally, did I not throw that last question in there purely as a hedge against people potentially pointing out that I got it wrong so that I could say I did it on purpose to make a point? I'll never tell. It's the, the paradox is the atheist saying, um, I'm an atheist, I, I don't believe in objective moral values and duties, yet what about the problem of evil? With the language analogy, that's the equivalent of saying, I don't believe in an objective source of grammatical rules, so how can anyone say that any grammar is objectively right or wrong? Hell, even in the vernacular dialects that technically break a lot of the traditional grammar rules, they still have their own sets of rules that they follow by which a speaker of that dialect can recognize if the dialect is being used correctly. And there is discussion about how speakers of these various dialects should not be punished for not obeying the traditional grammar rules, because by the rules of their dialect, they are correct. The important thing is not which set of rules are obeyed, but whether or not the intended meaning is successfully conveyed from the author or speaker to their audience. This is one reason why I stopped responding to the creationist tendency to pluralize the word evidence incorrectly. I know what they mean when they say it, so even if it bothers me, it doesn't actually matter. The other reason is that there is a grammatically correct way to use the word evidences, so if I corrected them when they were actually using it correctly, the grammar police would then wind up in my comments correcting my correction. And while I do have a fairly good intuitive sense of correct and incorrect grammar, I know next to nothing about the specific rules of grammar. I had to look up whether you was the second or third person pronoun for this, because that's just not the kind of knowledge that I find even the slightest bit interesting, so spending time researching something like that just to be petty about something that didn't hinder my understanding of what they were saying is just tiresome. Okay, I think I've lost track of the analogy. Back to Mike! And that's why the problem of evil remains a common source of doubt among religious people, or for religious people. And here's where I want to be super straight, right? Yeah, this absolutely is a common source of doubt for religious people. The problem of evil is probably the number one argument against God that I think people are persuaded by, impacted by, especially when they're going through really hard times and they can't explain it. So there you go. You agree with me that plenty of people wind up leaving Christianity because of the problem of evil, which means that you should also agree with me that God providing an answer to the problem of evil that actually covers all the bases and makes sense rather than just appealing to mysterious ways would be better than leaving apologists to try and figure it out on their own and floundering in the process. And my encouragement is this, I get that this is an effective and powerful argument that does draw some people away from God. Other Christians, it has like no effect on them, right? It just has no effect on them whatsoever. But some, it's really pulling them towards unbelief. I'm actually kind of surprised that Mike would say it in that way. It's pulling them towards unbelief is a statement that cannot be true, given Mike's other opinion that everyone believes in God deep down, and those who claim non-belief are just suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness. Unbelief is literally impossible in this view, so being pulled toward unbelief would then be a nonsensical statement. Now, maybe he meant it's pulling them towards suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness, but that's a weird way for the problem of evil to end. I don't like that bad things happen, so I will choose to suppress my knowledge of the being who will eventually fix it all? That would be a strange path to take indeed. Rejecting God or even just bitterness towards God. Okay, I guess I paused too early. There's the hedging. It's not pulling them to unbelief, it's pulling them to bitterness toward God, so that eventually they'll have the Kevin Sorbo moment where a skilled Christian debater pushes them into admitting that they really just hate God because a bad thing happened to them personally. Why do you hate God? Because he took everything away from me. And to that I say, that's why evil's character building. Um, this is part of the character building nature of evil. This is part of the real trials and real changes that go through our lives. But Christianity does offer intellectual answers to the problem of evil. It also offers emotional help to the problem of evil. But if you reject God, you lose both of those. Well, you definitely don't lose the intellectual answer. The answer there is merely that the universe doesn't care about us, so that's why bad things happen. 
Emotionally, it really depends on how you look at it, but even if I grant that you lose the emotional help with the problem, that would amount to an argument from consequences. I like the idea that I'll be happy forever in the afterlife better than the idea that this is the only life I get, so the happier one must be true. And that's a very shallow way to look at it. You can't explain the problem of evil's existence? Yes, you can. Apologists just like to play word games to try and convince people that we would be unable to figure out that we don't like being robbed and murdered without God telling us that. And you would seem like you'd have to deny it to be consistent. You can't offer any solution to the problem. The solution, as I've already said, is to try and make life as good as possible for as many people as possible. It's not a solution that is likely to ever be implemented perfectly, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And on top of that, it's a goal that even Christians should be able to get behind, as helping the poor is a repeating theme throughout both the Old and New Testament. It's a shame that so many Christians seem to think that Jesus saying that you will always have the poor with you gives them an excuse to not bother helping the poor, because no matter how hard we try, there will always be poor people. When what Jesus was really saying there was that the people giving expensive things to him instead of using the money to help the poor is an okay thing to do, because there will always be poor people with you, but Jesus wouldn't always be there. Which honestly isn't a whole lot better than the don't help the poor people interpretation, and comes with the nice little bonus of seeming to deny the modern Christian picture of Jesus as being someone who is always with you. And it ends up putting you in a worse position, yet ironically some atheists are proud of their lack of any hope. Like he kind of boasts about having a hopeless perspective of the universe as if it's like tough minded, but it's not, it's just, it's just not true. I wouldn't say that he's showing a pride in his lack of hope. I'd say that it's more that he sees the hope that Christianity provides as a false hope, and so is proud of being strong enough to face reality instead of opting to believe a hopeful lie. Which, you know, is not exactly how I would choose to look at it, but if Christianity isn't true, it's not exactly wrong either. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Chaos1925, who says, Ha ha. Well, I think I'll stop putting in effort listening to you here around six minutes in. Grifter, accusing Mike, the guy whose in-depth videos regularly go for hours, and none of yours are much over an hour long, and yet you accuse him of not putting in much effort. Here are some of the problems I found here within six minutes of your video. Mike was talking specifically about that little quote from Nietzsche, not all his work, and in this quote, Nietzsche was not talking about the lack in this life, but insulting Christianity with no proofs, just his own subjective edgy whining. Credit where it's due, you do link to the original video, but you do not play Mike's full clips here, and you mock him for being out of context, hypocrite. Before the clip you played, he had been talking about Nietzsche for about 14 minutes, and you know it. Blame the atheist website he was going off of, Allocation, if you want to blame anyone for taking that Nietzsche quote out of context there. Go ahead and get back to me about faith when you've studied ancient Greek, since you apparently don't know what synonyms are. There's a lot to unpack here, so I won't even mention me being a shit disturber who initially replied to this by saying, eh, that's too long, I stopped reading, so I'll just assume it was you telling me how much you like my video, and so I'll just get straight to addressing the comment without telling you about that first. So first, Mike's videos go on for hours, and none of mine are much more than an hour long. Therefore, Mike is more in-depth and puts in more effort than I do, apparently. Well, the video of Mike's that I've responded to in this series was originally an hour and 23 minutes long. I edited out him repeating himself and going off on unrelated tangents, and that left us with 36 minutes of actual content to respond to. My response to those 36 minutes, once this video is done, have a total runtime of 4 hours and 7 minutes. Even if we subtract the 36 minutes that Mike is speaking for in there, that leaves us with a significantly longer runtime on my end than on Mike's. So if we're just going by runtime, which as we saw in part 1, Mike himself certainly seems to think is an important metric. Hours and hours and hours of details, it's like 4 hours of content. Video down below that's over 3 hours. Then I win. Also, a good chunk of Mike's content is him doing off-the-cuff rambling while live streaming, and then cutting the live streams down into shorter videos to release, which is also something that I do on my other channel, The Watering Hole. And I can tell you that that is way easier to do than to do one of my scripted videos. One scripted video of mine typically takes me the whole week minus Wednesday to complete. Two days spent on scripting and research, half a day for filming, and a day and a half of editing. Wednesday, the only day that is not taken up by this, is the day that I spend preparing for my live stream and editing the clips of my previous live stream. So with the live stream method, I can pump out two to three hours of content, which then gets doubled as everything is released twice, once in the stream and once in a clip, so that's four to six hours of content for one day's work. 
a scripted video is a half an hour to an hour of content for four days work. And Mike doesn't even take the time to Google simple terms that he doesn't understand in order to make sure he's correct. All while he sits there reading from a web browser, presumably connected to the internet since he's usually also streaming it. And I don't remember what a philologist is. Is that like a philosopher? I mean, the study of philo could be love, philosophy, I don't, wisdom, I don't know. With regards to the Nietzsche quote, I don't see your problem with that. I wasn't looking at all of Nietzsche's work. I was looking at enough of his work to provide adequate context for the quote that Mike was specifically discussing, and reading the writings of other philosophers and theologians who were discussing that work, and considered it a work of genius, not his own subjective edgy whining. Mike didn't even bother to learn the context. He just assumed that on its own, it was enough. As to my not playing his full clip, I went back and watched the original. As I said, I cut this down to one 36 minute video and I did that before I responded to all of them. So it's entirely possible that I accidentally cut something out that was relevant, though 14 minutes of discussion on that specific topic seems a bit excessive. So the quote being discussed here begins at about the 48 minute mark in Mike's original video. In the 14 minutes before that, Nietzsche is discussed from about the 33 minute and 15 second mark to the 34 minute and 21 second mark. After that, most of the time is spent on the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence statement, which has nothing to do with Nietzsche. Now, in fairness, the section of the blog that this was dealing with was called Friedrich Nietzsche, but it had little to nothing to do with Nietzsche, as it was mostly the author misunderstanding another decontextualized quote from Nietzsche. But in fairness to me, if you actually watched the first six minutes of my video, you would have heard me say that this was part three in a series and that there's a playlist for the other parts, so you would have been able to see me cover that section thoroughly in part two. So no, I don't think it's hypocritical of me to say that Mike isn't bothering to look into the context of the statements he is criticizing, because while I did chop up Mike's video, I'm confident that I left all the important stuff in. Though, if you watch it and think that I missed something critical, I would be happy to address that. And yes, I do blame the allocation site for taking it out of context, not Mike. Again, if you actually did watch the first six minutes of my video and paid attention, you might have noticed that my criticism of Mike was not that he took it out of context, it was that he didn't even bother to attempt to figure out what it might have been saying in context, instead dismissing it as baseless mockery when theologians and philosophers have been discussing and debating about it for over a century. On top of that, I know that before the six minute mark, I explained how it's a concept that was an echo of the words of Jesus when he tells people to store up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Focus on the next life, not on this one. So even without examining context, Mike still could have given it a more serious treatment, but he chose instead to dismiss it without putting any thought into it. And therein was my main problem with how he responded to it. As to the ancient Greek synonyms thing, yeah, I kind of blew off that point, but I do have other videos where I discuss it in more detail, and given that each wrong thing Mike says takes a shit ton of research on my part in order to fully explain why the thing he said was wrong, I had to choose my battles, and I decided that that wasn't an important one in the moment. Thanks for watching, I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I live stream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Stream with my partners on hiatus until she's done school at the moment, so none of that anymore. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Tarika or Tarika Chamberlain, and all the rest, who are the hours of content that make my channel credible to the bottom rung apologist. If you'd like to actually be a mostly useless metric, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO Box address is in the description. See you next time.